When I was invited to chair this meeting, I jumped at the chance for four reasons. The first was the venue, and um, this building represents 350 years worth of the pursuit of knowledge. It had its 350th anniversary last year. And uh, it includes the portrait over there, Lord Porter, of one of my heroes, a phenomenal man. I remember as a boy seeing an interview on television with him and being spurred on in terms of the pursuit of knowledge. But above all, I was very pleased to accept the invitation because of the speaker. I suspect a lot of you were in Oxford in 2009 when Robert was one of the keynote speakers at the Libraries of the Future debate. I certainly was there, and I was, I was very energised and motivated and indeed inspired by what was being said there, and it certainly made me, me think. And all the videos and transcripts from that 2009 debate are still available on the GISC website. They have been a very popular uh, set of resources there, and I'm not surprised. Anyway, we're here today to hear about the DPLA, and we're here to hear from Robert. Uh, because it, we're paperless in GIST now, there's no handout of his CV. It would be a, several pages if there were a handout, and a very impressive CV it is too. Um, as you know, he's the Carl H. Fortzheimer University Professor and Director of the Harvard University Library. He's been a visiting professor or fellow at many universities and institutes for advanced study, and he's edited or written over two dozen books in his specialist areas, and uh, as I say, a very impressive CV. But what is most impressive in our context today is the fact that he's such a visionary force in the world of libraries, and particularly has been a driving force in Harvard's adoption of open access, and that's certainly a topic we want to cover this afternoon. But of course, the main person who's instigated the ambitious and forward-looking digital public library of America. Robert, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, David Baker and uh, Sconnell and Jisk, uh, all of you for coming. We are all in this together, and I think the remarks about the spirit of collaboration are really right on target. What makes collaboration interesting, in a way, are the differences. And obviously, I come from a different context. Uh, I'll try to explain that in the course of my talk. Uh, one thing, though, I would also like to thank you for is for not inviting me to talk about the death of the book. <laughs> I've been invited to so many conferences on the death of the book that I think it must be very much alive. Um, it, it reminds me of a favorite joke among the publishers in the U.S. anyhow, which goes as follows. One publisher is talking to another, and uh, the first one says, question, what was the first book published? Answer, the Bible. Question, what was the second book published? Answer, the death of the book. Uh, books are not dead. More books uh, were published last year than ever before in the history of the globe. About a million new titles, many of them uh, in the form of the old-fashioned printed codex. And the UK is, I think, the greatest source of publishing old-fashioned codexes. Uh, you have uh, you had uh, your Super Thursday was it was October first uh, two years ago when you published eight hundred books on one day, printed books. I mean the printed book is doing very well. Thank you. Just a reminder because we're all here in favor of at least I'm in favor of open access and digitizing these printed books, but we're uh, I am trying to explain express the fact that we are going through a period of transition. I don't think it's there are either or propositions, the digital or the analog. Rather, there will be lots of very interesting combinations of the two, and we have to work our way through this transitional period into a future that certainly will be overwhelmingly digital. So I would like to, uh, having said that, begin the way a, uh, uh, an American ought to begin by quoting the, one of the founding fathers. That is, I would like, it, with your permission, to invoke Thomas Jefferson. His portrait isn't on the wall here, but uh, I can hear him listening from the uh, Odula, as he called it. In a letter to Isaac McPherson in 1813, it's a very famous letter quoted by all Jefferson scholars, 
he developed a metaphor which is a description of the way intellectual communication actually takes place. It's a process of spreading light from one taper or candle to another. Here's Jefferson, quote, if nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others of exclusive property, it is the action of the thinking power called an idea, which an individual may exclusively possess as long as he keeps it to himself. But the moment it is divulged, it forces itself into the possession of everyone, and the receiver cannot dispossess himself of it. Its peculiar character, too, is that no one possesses the less because every other person possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me, end quote. Well, Jefferson wasn't exactly thinking of the internet, but I think that is the message, and I would add to it open access, free access for humanity to the collective good of humanity. This, however, may sound utopian. Now, I actually think we need injections of utopian energy, especially in difficult periods of economic downturn, but there's always a problem of well, the real world out there, I don't accept, accept the distinction between the real world and the academic world, but let's presume it does exist. They would say, you academics are off on cloud nine. You don't understand the realities. Well, actually, there's a lot of unemployment in the academic world as well as the real world. And one way to deal with unemployment is through access to the internet. We have in the New York Public Library 87 branches, and they are full of people who are looking for jobs because they can't read their daily newspaper. The daily newspapers no longer have want ads about jobs. They go to the neighborhood library in order to have access to the internet where jobs are posted. So the libraries are developing all kinds of new functions in the real world. And we have learned, there's very hard evidence for this, that open access helps business. It creates jobs. So uh, I'm trying to reject the notion of utopianism, even though I believe in it, and to get back to Jefferson's idea of candlelight power, enlightenment. It may seem archaic today, of course, but I think it can acquire a 21st century luster if you associate it with the internet, the internet which multiplies messages at virtually no cost. And if this kind of internet enthusiasm, for which I make no apologies, if it sounds suspiciously idealistic, you could extend the chain of associations to a key hard-boiled concept of economics, that of a public good. Public goods such as clean air, efficient roads, hygienic sewage disposal, all sorts of services like that, including adequate schooling, they benefit the entire citizenry and one citizen's benefit does not diminish that of another. Public goods are not assets in a zero-sum game, but they do carry costs, upfront costs, usually paid through taxation, at the production end of the services and facilities that the public enjoys as users. The Jeffersonian ideal of access to knowledge as a public good does not mean that knowledge is costless. We enjoy freedom of information, but information is not free. Someone had to pay for Jefferson's taper. Now, I stress that point because I believe that few people have any idea of what it costs to provide them with the information that they get every day through the internet. Instead, 
they complain about information overload. My doctor, for example, laments that the growth of medical knowledge doubles every two years. But, of course, he knows nothing about a tendency that undercuts that growth, namely commercialization. According to one reliable source, the amount of research published in medical journals does indeed double over two-year periods. The uh, United States Library of Medicine reports that the number of medical journals increased from 3,472 in the year 2000 to 4,866 in 2010. And the number of citations to the articles in these journals increased from 10.7 million in 2000 to 18.3 million in 2010. How anyone could find all pertinent information, even with a powerful search engine in this ocean of publications, is difficult to imagine. But doctors keep trying. There was an average of 3.5 million searches a day in this literature in 2009. What the doctors fail to understand, and not just the doctors, but the biological uh, researchers and the physicists and the chemists and uh, some of the philosophy professors, is that these searches take place in fenced-off territory, which belongs to the publishers, in this case the publishers of the medical journals. The publishers charge exorbitant prices for access to this terrain, and their enclosure movement increases while cyberspace expands. So yes, more knowledge is being constantly produced, and an increasingly small proportion of it is accessible to the public. That second point, I think, is what is not being adequately noticed. I would like to discuss this tendency toward commercialization in relation to the costs of journals and books and then to suggest how it could be reversed by treating knowledge as a public good provided through the Internet. If I may return to the example of my doctor, I should explain that he works in a teaching hospital connected with the Harvard Medical School. (coughs) Through his computer and his smartphone, he has access to all of the journals that the medical school buys, buys, that is, as subscriptions to electronic editions. This year, the cost of those subscriptions to the Harvard University Library just for medical journals came to $2.5 million. The journals include the Journal of Comparative Neurology, list price, $29,000 a year for one year subscription. Uh, Also, brain research, list price $23,000 a year. Biochemica and Biophysics Acta, list price $20,000 a year. The cost of academic journals in general has increased at four times the rate of inflation since 1980. Everything indicates it will continue to increase upward on the same trajectory, even though university budgets have suffered drastic cutbacks. According uh, to one expert body, EBSCO, journal prices will uh, increase by 4 to 6% in 2012. Another even better estimate by the Library Journal is that they will go up from 7 to 9%. So how can that increase in price be sustained? Health may be a public good, but information about health is monopolized by publishers who extract as much profit as the market will bear. Now, this, of course, is not news to librarians, and probably many of you here have been through the budget crunch, which is extremely uh, painful. I've enjoyed opportunities to uh, exchange information about this subject with several British librarians, and I think some of you are leading the effort to try to contain this exorbitant price increase. 
still, we all have to make room in our budgets for the hyperinflation of journal prices year after year, and we've been doing it for three decades. So we librarians understand it, but academics don't. And I think that observation points to the irrationality at the heart of the system. We academics do the research, we write the articles, we do the refereeing of other articles, we sit on the editorial boards, we are the editors, and then we buy back the product of our own labor, which we do for free at exorbitant costs uh, demanded by the publishers. I mean, it is simply crazy as a system. And I think this irrationality has to be exposed and dealt with. And moreover, this creates a kind of vicious circle because as the price of the journals goes up, of course, libraries have to deal with it somehow in their budgets. And as many of you know, the reaction is, well, we can't cut off the circulation, especially of science, so we'll cut back on monographs. And we've seen an adjustment in uh, acquisitions policies whereby the periodical acquisitions go up, the monograph acquisitions go down, therefore university presses find they can't sell as many monographs because the library market is crucial, and they start cutting back on publishing them. Once they cut back, what happens to young academics who are trying to break into print? Well, publish or perish, and many indeed are perishing in these hard times. So I think that there is a kind of absurdity at the heart of a system in which we've all been living, and we've got to deal with it. We have to confront it. It's true that publishers will reply by deprecating the naive idealism behind the Jeffersonian commitment to the spread of light. Not only did Jefferson discount the cost of his taper, but as some of you may know, he wasn't a very good businessman himself, especially when it came to managing his estate at Monticello. Of course, it can be expensive to produce a scholarly journal. There are referees to be organized, texts to be edited, pages to be designed, issues to be printed or transmitted by high-tech servers, and subscriptions to be sold and collected. Journal professionals do add value to journals. No one would deny that. And journal publishers deserve a fair return on their investment. But what is fair. Last year, Elsevier's profit margin was 36% on revenues of two billion pounds. Other publishers often report profits of 20 to 40%. In its analysis of their practices, the Deutsche Bank concluded, quote, if the process really were as complex, costly, and value-added as the publishers protest that it is, 40% margins wouldn't be available, end quote. Now, publishers might answer this objection by invoking the so-called marketplace of ideas, one of these cliches that gets bandied about all the time. They could turn the Jeffersonian argument against itself by asserting that in a free market of ideas, the best will triumph whether embodied in articles or books or any other format, the best will sell and sell at a fair price determined by demand. Unfortunately, however, demand is not flexible in the world of scholarly periodicals. Publishers create journals in specialized sectors where they can have all the territory to themselves. And once they have staked out their turf, they can keep competitors out by assembling an illustrious board of specialists and basically uh, making sure that they can crush competition. In fact, competition rarely exists in the esoteric sectors of science, 
And the big three publishers, Elsevier, <coughs> Wiley, Blackwell, and Springer, publish 42% of all journal articles. They often group journals in bundles, selling the newer and more obscure publications with the better known ones in carefully managed big deals, which seem to offer bargain prices. But if a buyer attempts to take apart the bundle and weed out the less desirable journals, the prices of those that remain jump to a level as high or higher than the original bundle. Moreover, the subscription contracts commonly contain non-disclosure clauses so that one library cannot know the terms uh, obtained by others. Far from being free, the market is manipulated and monopolized. Private gain eclipses public good, and Jefferson's taper is reduced to an ashen glimmer. How long can this price uh, gouging continue? Well, we may be nearing a breaking point because some research libraries have simply found it impossible to pay for the continual uh, increase in journal prices. They refuse to renew subscriptions and write out complaints from faculty members who demand an unlimited supply of the latest research. Sometimes they provide pay-per-view access to individual articles although the publishers retaliate by increasing this kind of pricing too. Wiley Blackwell commonly charges $42 to read one article. Few libraries have summoned up the courage to walk away from the table in contract negotiations when faced with really unbearably expensive terms. The alternative is a long-term strategy to reverse the economics of the publishing industry by treating the research as a public good and doing so in a a manner analogous to the financing of public roads. It could be paid for at the production end and made available free to users. Although the U.S. government already subsidizes a great deal of research and also of publishing of the research through the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Science Foundation, it probably can't increase its subsidies. We're having tough times in the U.S., just as you are with your government (coughs) here. But universities could pay processing fees to faculty who contribute to open access journals. If the fees amount to enough to cover a journal's production costs plus a fair return, the journal could be published free of charge online. And if enough journals switch to open access publishing of this kind, libraries would save so much in subscription costs that they could regain mastery of their budgets and invest more in acquiring (coughs) materials of all kinds from printed books to digital databases. So I'm prefacing my remarks about the Digital Public Library of America with a reminder, even though most of you may not need it, about how we have been suffering from monopolism and commercialism on the part of journal publishers, because that's a crucial background to keep in mind while uh, considering the possibilities of creating a new kind of library, as you are doing in this country and we are doing in the U.S. Now, I've actually surrounded my argument, you may have noticed, with some problematic ifs, and I don't want to minimize the economic difficulties and institutional complexities inherent in such a radical change, a change so, so that public scientific publications for books, articles, uh, anything, will be done at the production end and then made freely uh, available at the consumption end. But conditions are already changing so rapidly that extraordinary possibilities are opening up, and I think we should grasp them. New knowledge is increasingly born digital. It's transmitted digitally and stored in digital repositories. Clear distinctions no longer exist between texts and data, articles and books, searching and researching, (coughs) posting and publishing, authorship and readership, writing and mixing and mashing. 
the blurring of boundaries and the untethering of knowledge may make us uncomfortable, <laughs> but they belong to a transformation of the landscape of information that will create new room for the public good. To illustrate this point, I would like to now devote the rest of this time uh, to a discussion of one of these possibilities, the attempt to build a digital library that will make the cultural heritage of the United States accessible, free of charge, to all Americans and, in fact, to everyone in the world. Although fantasies about a mega, meta, macro library go back to the ancients, the possibility of actually constructing one is recent. It dates from the creation of the Internet, 1974, and the Web, 1991. Google demonstrated that the new technology could be harnessed to create a new kind of library, one that, in principle, could contain all the books in existence. But Google Book Search is a story of a good idea gone bad. As first conceived, it promised to do what Google did best, searching for pertinent information. Google would digitize millions of books provided for free from research libraries. Actually, uh, we didn't provide the books. Uh, I mean, they did the digitizing for free, but it turned out to be very expensive uh, to those of us in the libraries. Harvard paid $1.9 million just in transactional costs <coughs> to have Google, Google digitize free 850,000 books in the public domain. Users would be able to locate material in Google Book Search by entering keywords and examining short snippets called up from the digital database. Google would not produce the texts of the books, and it would indicate where they could be found in the nearest library. So at first, it sounded simply terrific. But because most of the books were covered by copyright, the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers brought suit for alleged infringement of their intellectual property. Google could have defended itself by invoking the doctrine of fair use, which you call fair, I always forget it, the fair dealing. Fair dealing. That, however, fair use or fair dealing is a, a tricky business because it hangs on arguments in the U.S. based on sections 107 and 108 of the 1976 Copyright Act whose obscurities have occupied lawyers for decades. I mean, try reading this 1976 Copyright Act if you want a good soporific. But Google could have hired the best lawyers in the country to make a convincing case for fair use. If it won, it would have scored a double victory for the public good. It would have promoted the accessibility of literature, and it would have established a broad and firm legal basis for the fair use of that literature. So there was a moment when Google Book Search first appeared over the horizon that looked tremendously promising. And of course, that promise has turned into a terrible deception. Why? Because instead, Google chose the path of commercialization. After three and a half years of secret negotiations with the plaintiffs, those who so sued it, for breach of copyright, it reached a settlement with them which transformed the original search operation into a speculation based on the database of the books. Access to the texts of the books would be sold back to the libraries, the very same libraries which had provided them for free, um, for an annual subscription fee which would be set by representatives of the plaintiffs and Google. Free of pressure from competition and from oversight by any public body, the cost of the subscription, that is, libraries would have to subscribe to the database, an annual subscription, it could 
rise as disastrously as the cost of the academic journals, which were already killing us in the world of libraries. The settlement, therefore, came down to an agreement about how to divide a pie. Google would get 37% of the profits. The authors and publishers would get 63%. Now, this settlement, as it was called, had to be accepted by a federal court because it involved something called a class action suit, and a judge had to verify that the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers actually represented authors and publishers in general. The Guild has only 8,000 members, but several hundred thousands of Americans have published at least one book. And in fact, 6,800 authors actually uh, took advantage of an opt-out clause in the settlement by notifying Google that they did not want to participate in its enterprise. Conflicting interests made it difficult to believe that the plaintiffs spoke for any coherent class, as it's known in American law. Judge Denny Chin of the Southern Federal District of New York therefore rejected the settlement in a decision announced on March 23rd 2011. He also emphasized other equally strong objections to it, including the fact that it threatened to constitute a monopoly and that it would give Google exclusive control over orphan works, that is, books whose copyright owners have not been identified. So far, Google and the plaintiffs have failed to rework the settlement in a way that would make it acceptable to the court. At a hearing last September 15th, Judge Chin granted them six more months to come up with another plan, but, and I won't get into the legal complexities of this, there was a parallel uh, class action suit over copyright, which involved a group of freelance writers, and it too failed to get clearance from another court in New York. The legal obstacles, therefore, seem formidable. It may be too early to declare Google book search dead, but I, for my part, do not see how it can be revived. Whatever the fate of Google's attempt to commercialize access to digitized books, the time has come to relight Jefferson's taper. We now have it in our power to create a digital library that will make our cultural heritage available free of charge to all Americans and to the entire world. On October 1st, 2010, uh, I called together a group of heads of foundations, heads of libraries, computer scientists. Uh, we proposed a very brief uh, sketch of what we call the Digital Public Library of America, and almost immediately everyone at this just exploratory meeting said, we can do it. And we can come up with the money thanks to something that makes the U.S. rather different from most other countries, and that is private foundations that are public spirit, that are devoted to the public good. <clears throat> the basic idea was simple. Form a coalition of foundations to provide the funding. Form a coalition of libraries to provide the books. But, of course, the task is enormously complex. After taking its measure, uh, this initial group, which just self-appointed appointed enthusiasts, if you like, created a secretariat. We have a small administration located in a center at Harvard. We have a steering committee that is taking charge of our tentative policy decisions. And we have six working groups that have recruited people from all over the country in different sectors, not just higher education, to work through lots of the complexities that must be solved. Uh, so we actually got organized. And at a meeting in Washington last October 21st, we announced the basic uh, outlines of what we are proposing. So it's possible now to have a clear view, or at least a preview, of the DPLA's most important features. And that's what I would like to describe in the rest of my time. 
these are my thoughts. I mean, they're not the official policy of the steering committee, but there are uh, five points I'd like to stress. <coughs> the DPLA's scope and content, its possible costs, the legal problems it will face, its technical architecture, and its governance. Scope and content. The DPLA, and actually it's a, it's a mouthful, Digital Public Library of America. We've had a lot of discussions even about the name, but I'll spare you some of that. Uh, it will not draw on one gigantic database. So don't imagine a grand building like the Library of Congress sitting on one single database. Instead, it will be a distributed system which will aggregate collections from many research libraries, museums, and other institutions. In other words, it's quite similar, I think, to what JISC and others of you are contemplating here. It will provide one-click access to documents in many formats, including images, recordings, and videos. At first, however, it will consist primarily of books, books in the public domain. Google digitized about 2 million of them, and copies of its digital files have been deposited at Hathi Trust, a digital repository set up in Michigan to preserve the output of Google's digitizing. The Internet Archive, a not-for-profit open-access digitizing operation founded by Brewster Kale, also can make available millions of files of digitized books. Research libraries everywhere have digitized great swaths of their special collections independently of Google. For example, at Harvard, we have digitized and made freely accessible 2.3 million pages of public domain material in something we call our Open Collections Program. And also, we are cooperating with China in a program to digitize 51,500 rare Chinese books, which we have, but the Chinese don't have, in our uh, Yanqing library. Government sources are particularly rich. Uh, each of the 50 states in the United States has had its own project for digitizing all of the newspapers from that state, going back to their origins. And all 50 of these uh, amalgamated uh, or aggregated collections are being themselves aggregated in one gigantic database at the Library of Congress, which is going to contribute this fabulous research source to the Digital Public Library of America. So by combining these kinds of special collections and digitized uh, riches that exist everywhere, the DPLA can lay a foundation of incomparable depth and breadth from the very beginning before it even begins to move into the world of copyrighted material. But that world, of course, is where the problem lies. Copyright laws prevent the public domain from extending beyond 1923 in the US. Most 20th century literature will therefore remain out of bounds for the DPLA unless some legal way can be found to include it. And even assuming that co the copyright barrier could be adjusted, where should the boundary be drawn if you're trying to decide what the scope of this future library will be? Some argue that its uh, holding should continue right up to the present. Um, and that is, of course, provided that some kind of agreement can be reached to compensate rights holders. Were that possible, the DPLA would become a truly public library for the entire country. But it also might undermine the public libraries that already exist, because local authorities could cut their funding on the erroneous pretext that the DPLA would provide their basic material. And public libraries in the U.S., even though they're crammed with users, some of them looking for jobs, as I explained, are going through a very hard period, just as they are in this country. For my part, this is just my opinion, 
I think that DPLA's mission should be defined in a manner that would make its services clearly distinct from those of existing public libraries. It should leave them to supply their users with current material, whether best-selling novels or magazines or DVDs, and supplement that function by providing access to the vast corpus of works that constitute our cultural heritage. Where, then, would its collections stop? Most books go out of print with astonishing rapidity. In fact, if they make it into bookshops at all, their shelf life is a matter of days. Um, and few of them continue to sell, even as ebooks, after a year. I therefore suggest that the DPLA exclude everything published within the last five or ten years, and that a moving wall, which would advance a year at a time, keep it from interfering in the current market. Now, I don't know whether that makes sense in the British context, and I'm not proposing anything for you, but just trying to explain how we are looking at the problems on the other side of the ocean. The second point concerns costs. The DPLA will almost certainly be a distributed system which will aggregate collections that already exist in research libraries. When it opens, as we expect, very soon, um, it probably will contain only a basic stock of public domain works and special collections furnished by research libraries, as I have explained. From that point onward, it will grow as fast as the funding permits, but its initial expenses will be devoted for the most part to the creation of its technical architecture and administration. It will be designed in a way that will make it interoperable with major digital libraries in other countries, especially, of course, here with what you are in the process of creating. And in fact, the DPLA has already reached an agreement to cooperate with Europeana, the pan-European digital library that aggregates content from 27 countries. Europeana now runs on a budget of 5 million euros a year, but it does not become directly involved in digitization, collection development, and preservation. The example of Europeana therefore suggests the bare minimum of what it would cost to get the DPLA up and running. What would it cost if the DPLA led a major effort to digitize books that are covered by copyright but are out of print? Now, I know the term out of print is archaic, and Google prefers a rather um, suggestive uh, expression, books that are commercially unavailable. Uh, and actually, that's not so bad in many ways because all publishers today have electronic backlists and they can print on demand like that. So the very notion of a book being out of print is problematic. But still, I think for the sake of discussion, um, the question is how could we uh, make these uh, digitize in a very large scale books that are out of print, not commercially available, uh, but covered by copyright. Brewster Kale, who has digitized more than a million books for his internet archive, says he can digitize a book for 10 cents a page. And that would come to $30 for an ordinary book of about 300 pages. He estimates that he could digitize the contents of a great library, one with 10 million volumes, that is somewhat between the libraries of Princeton and Yale, for example, for a total of only $300 million. Now, other experts find those estimates too low. I don't know if you've um, ever debated with Brewster Kale, but he's got uh, tremendous energy. and He's one of these MIT quasi-geniuses who manages to pull off terrific uh, experiments and to create new ideas, and in this case, to use them for the public good. He's not out to make profit. He's already created several countries, and he says, I can do it cheap, 10 cents a page. Well, some of the others say, well, 10 cents a page, it's more like, well, the estimates uh, vary. One is a uh, dollar a page. 
Uh, they note these other experts that aside from scanning, of course, a great deal of work must be done to perfect the metadata uh, to assure preservation, which probably we estimate comes to 20% of the original digitizing costs, not to mention other possible services such as curation and the development of apps. But the costs of digitization and preservation are decreasing. One one, uh, estimate is preservation costs go go down by 50% a year. I don't know how accurate that is, but the technological uh, improvements are really quite remarkable. So the DPLA will begin with a base of several million volumes, and it will grow incrementally by digitizing at a rate that conforms with its budget. What will that budget be? No one knows until a final model is perfected sometime, uh, well, sometime in the course of this year. By combining ballpark and back-of-the-envelope estimates, one could imagine digitizing a million books a year on an annual budget of 75 to $100 million. I, just to give you some comparison, the budget of the Library of Congress in fiscal 2010 came to $684.3 million. If a grand coalition of foundations contributed $100 million a year, a great library would exist within a decade. Double that rate, and the library soon would be the greatest that ever existed. But we needn't rush. We must do the job right, because the DPLA should last for centuries, and it could grow gradually on a budget of $10 million a year. The third point concerns legal issues. Of course, the DPLA must respect copyright. How far it can go in making accessible books that are out of print but covered by copyright depends on the interpretation of copyright laws by the courts and maybe even the possibility of modifying those laws by congressional action. Now, this is rather difficult territory. Some of us don't have much Congress and the ability of Congress to do anything, much less modify copyright laws. We've had 11 copyright laws in the U.S. in the last 50 years, and uh, some would say each is worse than its predecessors. Maybe the best one was the first copyright law of 1790, but that's another subject. I won't go into that. Still, the history of copyright in the United States goes back to the Constitution itself, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, which sets two objectives in copyright. Quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, end quote. Now, this first copyright law, passed in 1790, struck a balance between those two objectives by giving authors an exclusive right to income from their writing for 14 years, renewable once. At that time, Jefferson's taper was burning bright, and American statesmen took heed of British precedent. Um, Parliament had adopted the 14 years renewable once uh, time limit in the original uh, Statute of Anne of 1710. And then, as you probably know, there were several, several fascinating court cases that ran right through the 18th century to determine whether or not, according to supposed principles of common law, there could be perpetual copyright. And there were great lawyers who argued for perpetual copyright, notably Blackstone. Um, In fact, uh, the same argument took place in France, where Diderot was in favor of uh, perpetual copyright. And probably Alexander Pope was as well. So there are a lot of heavyweights on the side of perpetual copyright, but as you probably know, in the famous case of Donaldson versus Beckett in 1774, it was abandoned. Perpetual copyright was rejected. It was a crucial thing. It's true that there were exceptions. Um, For example, uh, Clarendon's uh, history of the uh, English Civil War was given a perpetual copyright to the University of Oxford, 
and that's why Oxford has a beautiful Clarendon building. But basically, perpetual copyright was dead as a concept after 1774 in Britain, and it was also dead in France and in Germany through parallel uh, legislation, which I, I will skip over. Still, uh, Hollywood doesn't think that way. Hollywood actually wants perpetual copyright, Mickey Mouse forever, um, and in the so-called Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998, the lobbyist for uh, Hollywood, Jack Valenti, was asked, um, do you actually favor perpetual copyright? And he said, well, no, I think copyright should last forever minus one day. <laughs> Well, since then, the flame of Jefferson's taper has nearly died out. The current limit of copyright, the life of the author plus 70 years, tips the balance decisively in favor of private interests at the expense of the public good. The public domain extends only to 1923, so every book published after that, or certainly after 1963, is now covered by copyright, whether or not its copyright has been renewed. The status of many books published between this, this, this problematic area between 1923 and 64 in the United States, the status of books in that, during that period uh, remains ambiguous for various reasons, but that, and that's where most of the problems of orphan books are located. Anyhow, further legislation could solve this rather messy problem. But lobbyists had such a heavy hand in attempts to pass orphan book legislation in 2006 and 2008 that some people consider it impossible to get Congress to solve this problem. Some even say that the amended drafts of the legislation of 2008 were worse than no legislation at all. So it could be that the only recourse will be to sections 107 and 108 of the copyright law of 1976, which, as I mentioned, open the way for fair use of copyrighted materials. Unfortunately, that way passes over some very difficult terrain. There is something called a section 108 study group, which met uh, involving librarians and uh, law professors who specialize in copyright law. It met for two years. It came up with several good ideas. Nothing happened. So uh, one can't be too optimistic about getting something done about the Section 108 of the old copyright law. Fair use, though, normally applies to non-commercial activities such as criticism, scholarship, and teaching. Google's original search and snippets enterprise involved advertisements intended, of course, to bring in revenue for a profit-minded business. By contrast, the DPLA will be a not-for-profit association dedicated to the public good, and therefore it might stand a better chance with a fair use defense in case it should be sued by owners of copyrights to books that had Digit, had been digitized in the mistaken belief uh, that they were orphans. So we face a problem. Should the DPLA take that risk of litigation? Probably not. Orphan book legislation might provide immunity from litigation and, and set up an escrow fund to compensate rights holders of books that had been treated as orphans. And if congressional action really is hopeless, the DPLA could try to reach an agreement with authors and publishers whose copyrighted books have gone out of print. Google had attempted to do so in the settlement, which included an opt-out default. All authors were deemed to have accepted the terms of the settlement unless they notified Google to the contrary. Now, this aspect of the case especially troubled Judge Chin, because it seemed to give Google a, a monopolistic control over the entire body of orphan books. And there, we don't know how many orphan books there are, the fascinating diversity in estimates, but certainly a million uh, at, at a minimum. 
Could an opt-out provision pass muster if it were applied for the benefit of the public by a not-for-profit organization? Well, again, I'm afraid the answer is probably no. But a solution might be found in legal arrangements called extended collective licensing, which have been successfully developed in the Scandinavian countries. And are, you're, are you quite familiar with that? Maybe I should skip over this and we could discuss it if you like, or should I briefly mention it? Uh, the best example is Norway. Um, in Norway, every Norwegian can read a digitized version of every Norwegian book right up to the present, including all covered by copyright, free of charge. And they do this because there has been an extended collective licensing agreement in Norway with the uh, agreement of publishers and authors, and there's a fund set up to compensate the rights holders. So, but of course, Norway is a rather special country. They do have a good deal of oil offshore. More important, they have a tradition of collective action and a very public-minded authorities and publishers and authors and even a public-minded public government. Uh, so I'm not about to say that such a solution can be applied in a, in, a, in a single way to the United States, but we should consider it. And I think everyone should consider it. It's been worked out in Denmark. Denmark has a very interesting version of it. Uh, the Finns are uh, far advanced on it. Uh, you notice there's something Scandinavian to the, to the flavor of ECLs, as they're called. But I think it deserves more study, and this might be one way to deal with this fundamental problem of respecting copyright but not letting it kill your attempt to have a library that will include all the books in the 20th century. Let me now talk about the techn technical architecture of uh, the DPLA. Last June, um, the steering committee of the DPLA opened what we call a beta sprint, inviting anyone, anywhere, to make proposals for the uh, technological basis of this future library. More than 60 people expressed interest just like that. In the end, 40 competed. Uh, there were, there was, it was a three-month competition. Last September, we had a blue ribbon committee which announced the winners. Uh, actually, we decided there were six winners, and there are lots of different ideas. Some are sort of blueprints for the entire thing. Others are for special apps. Uh, th there, there was a, a, such an enthusiastic response that we feel we are tapping new ideas about technological possibilities. So we now have another special committee of uh, high-powered computer scientists and others who are going to try to figure out some way to combine all of the, the winning ideas with <coughs> others and create a technological prototype which will be announced actually pretty soon and then will become, as it's studied over again, the actual basis for the library. This prototype will be um, perfected before the DPLA is launched in April 2013. I repeat, April 2013, less than a year and a half from now. The race to this deadline may seem uh, uh, breathtaking, but it's fueled by enthusiasm and energy. Leading figures in computer science, information technology, and library science have assured us that the task is doable and we will get it done. The fifth point and last one, governance. Here I must be brief, not merely because I'm running out of time, but because the governance committee of the DPLA has only begun to study the possibilities for administering it after it's launched a year and a half from now. Where should it be located? Who should lead it? To whom should it be responsible? How will it formulate policy and administer its services? The present secretariat um, will continue to direct affairs during the final 18 months of the embryonic DPLA's existence, and we have a grant of $5 million just to get that job done, but that's simply to plan things. 
by April 2013, this newly born DPLA will have to set up headquarters, probably at a considerable distance from Harvard, where it all began. You know, you have to be careful if you're from Harvard in the U.S. because people will use this number one cuss word, elitism. Well, this is not going to be a library for the elite. It's going to be for the people of the United States. And in that respect, it might be a little different. I mean, I hope yours will be for the people of the United Kingdom, but you're thinking of higher education primarily. In and the what, first instance. Sorry? In the first instance. In the first oh, instance. Not so. Good. Well, maybe we could discuss that further. But on our part, in the first instance, we are aiming at a very broad public. And by that, I mean ordinary citizens. This library, I mean, think of it. If you've got digitized something greater than the Library of Congress, made available free to everyone, the smallest community college in North Dakota or Alabama will have instantly a fabulous resource for its students and faculty, but this will also be useful for K-12 education. It'll be useful for ordinary citizens who are just curious and want to get access to things. It'll be very useful for businesses because there is a lot of information in this great body of knowledge, and there are different ways of developing search mechanisms to um, weed out uh, or, and clear the way for information that will be relevant, especially to start-up businesses and small businesses as opposed to the large one, which already subscribe to uh, databases and special services that, that they need and that they can afford. So what we imagine is something that will be very important for the public of public libraries. And we have many... Uh, leaders of public libraries who are now part of our uh, steering committee and the various committees that are working on things. However, the question remains, um, how will all of this be governed? Um, and we haven't answered it yet. We're working on it. Uh, probably, uh, you know, we have um, something called the Section 501C3 of the Internal Revenue Code. That's a legislation that makes it possible for uh, public-spirited uh, organizations that are not-for-profit not to pay taxes. So we may set it up as a 501c3 uh, uh, in order to take advantage of this crucial uh, position in the legal structure of the country. At present, most people think the DPLA should not be a part of the federal government so that it will be free from political pressures. So it might resemble the National um, Academy of Sciences or the BBC or something else, but in fact, it won't resemble anything because nothing like it has ever existed. A library without walls that will extend everywhere and contain nearly everything available in the walled-in repositories of human culture. E pluribus unum, Jefferson would have loved it. Thank you.